Looks like we're live. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another recreational programming session. How about that? I bet you didn't expect that shit. So let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream as usual. Uh, I'm going to put a red circle, uh, then I'm going to say live on Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch dot a television website? Today we are doing machine learning in C. How about that? I bet you didn't expect that shit to happen. I didn't for sure. Uh, Twitch.tv slash toting. This is the place where we're doing all that. And I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinked. There we go. The stream has officially started. The stream has officially started. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, uh, machine learning, right? So you probably heard about this, uh, this thing for quite some time, right? So uh, it's rather a hot thing, I would say. Uh, so, and I'm gonna tell you that I'm not a specialist in that area at all. Uh, I'm just like, you know, you know, third person observer. Um, I understand some of the things, but I'm in no way claiming to be an authority on this topic. That's for sure. So take everything that I say with a grain of pepper. So uh, essentially, what is machine learning? I'm going to explain you how I understand this entire area. I understand this as the entire area as sort of like a different paradigm of programming, right? So, you know, we have uh, several paradigms of programming. Actually, we have two main paradigms of programming. Uh, it's, a, uh, you know, imperative programming and um, sort of like a function of programming. Uh, right. So, but I think machine learning is more of a, like a, an another third paradigm, right? In uh, the first two paradigms, you write the code directly, right? So you have a particular goal and you're trying to achieve that goal by just li literally writing that code. In case of machine learning, you're not really writing the code of the thing that you're going to be executing directly, right? Essentially, you have some sort of a model right that models some sort of a process that you want to predict or do something with that or maybe even optimize that uh, that entire thing and this model has uh, certain parameters right this model has certain parameters and what you code you code of the description of what you expect from this model like how do you expect it to behave and then you give your untra untrained model and the description of how it's supposed to behave to a learning process. And it just like tweaks it around until it fits your description well enough. And there you go. You've got the thing that does what you want, probably with a certain probability, because it's never going to be perfect. Right. Uh, so and that's how I understand it. So I personally like to call it uh, automatic uh, mathematical modeling, right? Because this is the thing that people have been doing for uh, ages, actually, for, uh, yeah, for ages, essentially, uh, mathematical model modeling by itself. We actually uh, learned this sort of a discipline in university. I went to university, I got a degree in feral metallurgy, right? <laughs> I like to joke that I have a degree in rust, uh, literally in rust, because feral metallurgy is a branch of chemistry that is concerned with converting feral oxide to steel, a cast iron and stuff like that. So it's an entire branch of chemistry concerned with processing feral oxide, aka rust. So I literally have a degree in rust. <laughs> So, and rust comes in the form usually uh, of uh, iron ore. So iron ore is usually literally rust, uh, unless it's uh, like a different kind of ferro oxide, which is black, uh, which is magnetite. I think it's called magnetite. All right. So, uh, and it's it's usually processed differently, uh, but usually it's a, it's the red one, right? It's it's the red one. So, and essentially, mathematical model for modeling for that specific. Uh, area was extremely important, right? So essentially because um, it's uh, this branch of chemistry was extremely concerned with industrial pro industrial processes of converting rust into usable usable iron, right? So steel or, and stuff like that. So and essentially the industrial process was uh, extremely expensive actually it was extremely expensive to start and then you have to wait uh, waste a bunch of resources to get uh, some sort of like a small yield and the yield usually depends on the initial parameters of the process 
So, and uh, what uh, the scientists who were working in that area were concerned with uh, is what's the optimal combination of parameters for that process, right? What's the optimal combination of parameters that process? We could just like literally experiment. We could literally experiment and see uh, like which one yields the best. But it's too fucking expensive, right? It's, it's just too freaking expensive. No one would literally allow you to waste money just to find the, uh, the optimal thing. So what people were doing instead, they were making fewer experiments, right? Fewer experiments, and each experiment would be like a point on a graph. And then they would create a mathematical model that fits that data. And using that mathematical model, they would predict what would be the best, uh, you know, uh, parameters for that uh, specific model, right? So, and all of that was done hundreds of years ago, like maybe like more than 100 years ago, fucking manually, on a piece of paper, with a fucking pencil, with nerds like me, right, in glasses and... <laughs> and anyway, so... Because there was no computers at the time, but people were doing that anyway. These days, the same process is simply automated. How is it automated? You just conduct a bunch of experiments, you feed those experiments into the computer, it just does automatic mathematical model, and you've got the mathematical model, you, you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. And that's basically machine learning. Right, so essentially you have the data, how your model is supposed to um, is expected to behave. Then we just tweak around the model, right? Uh, trying to see which model will fit that specific data. And there you go. So that's basically, uh, that's basically what it is. Something that was made, uh, right? Something that was made uh, manually long time ago now is uh, completely automatic. Right. And today I would like to explore, because here's an interesting thing. I uh, actually explained a very simple case, a very, not really very simple case, a very kind of like a mundane case, which is not probably interesting for anybody. You would say, oh, machine learning is only applied to this like boring shit as that nobody gives a fuck about. What the fuck is a ferromethodology? You're fucking crazy. Who fucking needs all of that shit except the nerds? I understand that. But here's an interesting thing. You can model anything literally anything for anything that you have a data you can fucking model it one of the things you can model is basically the probability of the next word in a sentence why not you can make a mathematical model out of that so you have a sentence and you can make a huge mathematical model that tries to predict the next sentence the next word in the sentence and then you can repeat the process and you can get ChatGPT. So <laughs> there is a direct connection with nerds sitting in a feral industrial plant and people in OpenAI uh, creating ChatGPT. They're using the same process. They're literally using the same process, actually. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, and this is what we're going to try to explore today. We're going to try to just uh, take that approach of essentially... Uh, I want to model something, but I don't have a model. Can we come up with an algorithm that, given how the model is supposed to exp uh, uh, um, behave, give me that actual model, right? Can we come up with something like that? We'll, we'll just explore that entire idea. We're going to start with this very abstract idea and see where we can go and see where we can go. So that's basically the plan for, for today's stream. I, th I hope it's going to be interesting. So uh, we've got some subs, I suppose. Uh, so let me let me see what we've got. So thank you so much, the Redco with Twitch Prime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was two days ago, but uh, since Twitch shows me uh, that, I want to acknowledge that. Uh, Valeny, thank you so much for uh, 23 months of tier 1 subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Fabio HBF, thank you so much for tier 1 subscription. Uh, Ormus Baxter, thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Andrew Zero, thank you so much for one gifted subs. And AkiXD underscore underscore, thank you so much for Twitch Prime subscription. And uh, Ice Leo, thank you so much for wasting a shit ton of money to Jeffrey Bezos because I'm not gonna get any of that. <laughs> ever but thank you so much for 100 community subs that just means that 100 people have an opportunity to speak in our discord server 
uh, right, because once you get sub, you actually can talk in the Discord server. So now 100 more people can uh, can say something there, right, and maybe have a, a beautiful time. Because a lot of people say who are, have a voice in our Discord server that uh, our Discord, uh, Discord server is actually quite pleasant uh, to talk in because it's it's very calm. Because it's closed, actually, it's not as crazy as other Discord servers, right? So it's actually very, like, very much isolated its own cultural bubble. Uh, and that's what makes it sort of nice, right? Because it's closed. But now, uh, 100 people can experience that. Thank you. Thank you so much for wasting so much money, but making 100 people, uh, you know, more happy, hopefully. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> it depends. But you, you can also use emotes now as well. <clears throat> so anyway, let's take a look. So uh, there was a very interesting example that I actually saw some time ago. Uh, I would like to credit the um, the author of that example, but I can't can't really seem to find that. So, uh, but just keep in mind that well, this example of machine learning, or rather, hello world of machine learning, I didn't come up with that example myself, right? So just keep that in mind. So let's create a C program. We're going to be using C, by the way, right? We're not going to use any fancy frameworks or any libraries or anything like, anything like that. We don't really need that for now. We're only learning the principles, uh, right? So we're going to start like from fundamentals, like it's a very much fundamental stream. We're going to use libc and just C, at least for now. Right, so we're not going to use anything else. Uh, actually, we're going to also use libmath, right, because we're going to use some of the function, mathematical functions, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to start with the hello world. All right, we're going to start with the hello world. Um, okay, so I'm going to return zero, and I'm going to say something like hello, seaman. Right. And uh, let me maybe uh, create a build.sh, build.sh, which is going to build all that. So bin.sh, and let's use Clang, uh, and let's compile it down to, to an executable. So I probably also want to enable all of the warnings and all of the extra warnings, just in case. And uh, I'm going to make this entire thing executable. Uh, so let's actually run it. And uh, actually, I want to enable the tracing so I can see uh, what exactly it is running. So it shows the command, as you can see. And if we run this entire thing, it says, hello, seaman. Okay. So let's train a very simple model, right? Let's train a very simple model that is trying to predict uh, some number based on the input number, right? So let's actually um, create a training set, right? So we're going to have a train and it's going to be an array of pairs of numbers. So the first number is going to be uh, the input of the model. And the second number is what we expect from the model, right? Very simple uh, model, right? One number in, one number out. Uh, and it's not predicting your age based on your age, no. <laughs> Have you guys seen that meme? <laughs> there, was a, there was a meme floating around on YouTube is that somebody was making like a neural network that uh, predicts your age based on your age, right? And it was actually performing with 98% um, <laughs> of success. <laughs> so in 98... Uh, 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 percent of the cases it would actually predict your age correctly based on the given age we're not going to be doing that it's so <laughs> but actually very close believe it or not actually very close uh so essentially if uh you are uh supplying zero right if you supply zero the model is supposed to respond with zero right if you supply uh one it's supposed to respond with two very interesting model, isn't it? Right. So if you provide two, it's supposed to return four. If you supply three, it's supposed to return six. If you supply, supply four, what, what would it return if you supply four? What it will return? Who knows? Mm, eight. It will uh, return eight. It's kind of obvious what this model is doing. It's kind of, you can see that it just multiplies the number by two, right? 
But let's imagine that the actual training data is immensely complex. It's like a missed, uh, like data set of uh, handwritten numbers. We don't fucking know any uh, parents in the data. We don't fucking understand it. It's so enormous. It has so many parameters. Holy shit, we don't know how to model this kind of shit. Like, we, we literally don't know. Like, that's the data we've got. And our boss said, like, model that, predict the next of the numbers. We don't fucking know what to do. What the fuck? If we don't do that tomorrow, we're going to get uh, fired. So the only thing we know about this model, right, is that it has roughly uh, a form, right, roughly a form of the output number y is equal to x multiplied by uh, w, where x is the input and w is some sort of a number, some sort of a number, the parameter or of our model, right. So here's the basically the gist of uh, machine learning. You, this is your model. This is your model, and this is your training set. But all of that is reduced, is, is compressed to very basic, very simple example, as simple as possible. But the same approach applies uh, even if you have more parameters in here, more inputs and more outputs in here, and it still applies if you have immensely more complicated formula in here. In fact, uh, the, the formula may consist of uh, millions and billions of of parameters in here, sometimes trillions. Uh, like GPT-4 is like a, a trillion of parameters. Like imagine a formula with trillion of parameters. A formula with trillion of parameters. Do you, do you know what is a trillion? Okay, so here is the thousand. So thousand is three zeros. Another three zeros is million, right? Another three zeros is billion. And trillion is Thousands of billions. Thousands of billions. Imagine a formula with thousands of billions parameters. Like it's unimaginable. You can't imagine it. It's like trying to imagine like a uh, like a black hole in the center of Milky Way. Like you can just like show a comparison and stuff like that. But our brain is just incapable of imagining that. It's just like you cannot imagine it. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're gonna uh, focus on uh, something that is one. So GPT-4, right? GPT-4 uh, is this, uh, and this is us. <laughs> We're gonna compress this entire shit to just one parameter. Like it's just gonna be one parameter because why not? Um, so yeah. Okay, and uh, essentially we don't really know what is this parameter, All right? So let me actually bring back the, the formula. I don't know why, why the fuck I removed it. Uh, right. We don't really know what it is, so we're probably going to start with some sort of a random number. Uh, unfortunately, in C, random numbers you can only have integers, but we can code something like random float. Uh, right, so we can code something like random float, which uh, let's say it's going to act like a JavaScript float, a JavaScript rand, which is returns like which returns the value from zero to one. Let's actually quickly code that. Right, so it's going to be something like rand float. Uh, right, and essentially, here's the thing. So rand by itself returns a random number from zero to a value to a constant value, which is called rand max or max rand i can never remember right but essentially if uh if if it's max rand the the, comp the compiler will tell me so i can easily fix that and essentially what we can do we can cast this entire thing to a float and then divide by a rand max uh, we can also cast it to a float just in case and this will effectively automatically give us an, a random number from zero to one right and we're going to initialize our model with a random number from zero to one right so this is basically what we're going to do uh, right, we're gonna put this thing in here, and let's actually try to rebuild this entire thing and see. Right, so rand max it doesn't have rand, so this is because I need to include stdlib. Uh, right, so and there we go. So this is the random number uh, from zero to one, but it's the same because we're using the same uh, seed for a random number generator, right? Because we don't really initialize it. That's why it's always the same, right? So one of the things we can do, we can try to initialize uh, the random number generator with the current time. So every time it's going to be uh, different. Seeded gacha hyper. 
Yes, thank you so much. That's exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be seeding it. Uh, right, so I'm going to provide the time. Uh, and uh, let's go. Right, so as you can see, it is different every time. Maybe we actually want to have a, uh, like a random number from 0 to 10. Who knows? Right. Uh, let's actually say it's going to be from 0 to 10. And uh, there we go. That should work. So it gives us random number from uh, 0 to 10. But maybe, if even though we want it to be random maybe for sort of like educational purposes we're gonna fixate it to something like 69 right so uh but but seeding it differently every time would be useful in the future right it will be useful in the future so i'm gonna keep it in here but for now i'm gonna just fixate it to to this right so we now uh need to find the value of w that actually satisfies this data but to know that it satisfies this data we need to actually measure that somehow how can we measure how well this parameter of the model satisfies that specific data we can just iterate through the inputs of the data and compare the results with expected results right we can just like do that right so let's just see let's just see how well that specific model fits our data does it even fit at all does it return the same shit or not I don't fucking know. Let's let's find out. Like, remember, we know nothing about the data and nothing about the model, right? So we can tweak the parameters. So let's just see how well does it perform, right? I'm gonna iterate through all of the data. It would be nice to have the the count for 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 the training data. So let's actually introduce something like train count, which basically takes uh, size of the train, right, and divides it by the size of a single element of the train. So effectively, in, this is what you have to do in C. Uh, effectively, it will give you the amount of uh, elements in here, right? So the amount of elements, so you can do something like train uh, count, uh, right? And what we can do in here, right? So we have an input. Input is basically train i0, right? So this is a train i0. So then we uh, basically feed that value into our model, right? So, and we basically do y equal to x multiplied by w. There we go. So our model is a single number. We just feed that input data into the model and we get the output. And we need to answer the question, is y equal to what we actually expect in here? Is it equal to that? I don't freaking know. Uh, one of the things we can do, we can just look at them, right? So we can say that uh, actual is this, uh, but expected, uh, expected uh, is actually this. Right, so something like this. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to remove this entire thing. And uh, let's see uh, what we have. Right. So essentially, the uh, actual value for the first input was uh, zero and expected zero. So everything works fine. So then an actual was seven. Far, far off, completely far off. Uh, but the expected was one. And as you can see, it doesn't perform well. It returns garbage. It, it literally returns garbage. Like, what the fuck is this model? We're going to get fired tomorrow. Uh, right. So let's actually have a measure of how bad this thing performs. So the way it's usually me measured is with the, like, sort of like um, uh, average square, right? Um, I think that's how it's called, right? Average square. So essentially, you find the distance between actual and expected, right? So you subtract the actual and, by the way, I'm, am I an idiot? Yes, I am an idiot. I'm supposed to put one in here. <laughs> it's supposed to uh, put one in here. Yeah, there we go. It's supposed to be two, four, and six. At, yeah. But I mean, you get the idea. Already hallucinating, yeah. <laughs> we haven't even trained anything, uh, but we're already hallucinating. Isn't that cool? Mm. And yeah, our model is already closer, right? That's right, our model is already way closer than it was before. We just had to use the right data. Uh, okay, so essentially what we want, uh, like a square mean error or something like that. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not an AI or a speciali specialist or mathematician, so I don't really know the fancy words. I'm Ooga Booga software developer, so I just uh, brute force Ooga Booga, brute force. Uh, uh, brute force that's that's what i know uh so <laughs> uh 
Uh, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So we want to find the, the difference between these things. Uh, so y minus the, the actual expected input, right? So, and this is sort of like the distance between them. And what you do, right, what you do, you basically accumulate, uh, accumulate the squares of those distances, right? So you accumulate the squares of those distances. Why squares specifically? So uh, the, the square uh, actually has a very interesting property is that if this distance is negative, it's, it doesn't really matter. Negative by negative is going to be positive. So it's always positive. That's one thing. And another thing is that any error is sort of amplified. Right. Even if you have like a little bit of an error, it's going to be amplified by the square. So something off is going to be instantly visible. Right. Something like far off is instantly visible. And that's uh, one of the reasons why people square. Can you like, um, you know, cube it to amplify it even more? Is that useful? Uh, and people also in the chat say that the square is steeper. All right. I don't really know the, uh, the, the actual reason, but this is how I think about it right so you sort of kind of amplify it uh right and the cube is going to be non-zero right so with the cube it's going to be kind of dangerous okay it could be negative and stuff like that for me for for my uga booga software development brain it it serves two purposes uh basically acting like an absolute right so i could have just like do abs somewhere in here right but on top of that it also amplifies any errors right so that's how my uga booga brain sees it uh i might be incorrect and i'm totally fine with that right so, and uh, after that, you want to actually kind of find the the average uh, of this entire error, right? So, after that, you want to divide it by the amount of uh, the training data. So, actually, let's uh, divide it by the training count. And this is uh, sort of like our measure how uh, badly uh, this model performs, right? If the value is uh, big, that means it actually performs really badly. So if it's equal to zero, that means it performs exactly as we expected. It fits that specific data perfectly. And there is, because of that, there is another interesting problem in machine learning uh, called overfitting, but we're not going to be talking about that. <laughs> right, but uh, basically overfitting is that when your model fits the data perfectly, but fails to predict any new data, it only focuses on, on the training data and does not recognize anything else outside of the training data. So this is a very common problem. There's a, a different ways uh, combating it, uh, but this is something to keep in mind, right? So you usually don't want to overfit your model, right? So and let's actually print this, uh, this entire thing, right? So let's actually print and see what's going to happen, right? So we're going to do that. This is how badly our model performs. It's fucking horrible. It's freaking horrible. Uh, right. And this entire thing uh, usually costs, uh, called cost function, right? Uh, it is usually called cost function. So let's actually maybe factor it out to a separate function. So we can just always at any point measure the cost of our model, right? Does it perform well? Or does it perform badly? I don't know. Let's actually have a, it's like a single uh, thing uh, that we have in here. Uh, it's also known as loss function. There are different names, uh, right? But, but for some reason, I kind of like to call it cost function. Uh, I kind of get used to calling it like that. So if it's wrong, please tell me. So, and as an input, we can accept the model, right? So we are accepting the entire model and the entire model is literally one parameter. Uh, and we're going to be just computing this entire stuff, right? So I'm going to just copy paste it in here. Uh, right. And I'm going to return all of that. So uh, let me now get rid of this entire thing. And here I can just do cost W. Right. Okay, cool. So here's an interesting thing. What we can do with this thing, our goal is to actually drive the cost function to zero. Right. We want to minimize it because the closer it is to zero, the clo the better the model uh, behaves on that specific training data. Right. So that's basically what it is. Uh, the only thing we can do, we can modify the one single parameter that we have. Uh, what we can do, we can just like wiggle it around, I suppose. Right. So let's actually uh, take like a very small value, like epsilon of some sort. Like it's going to be very small, like maybe uh, one thousandths. And let's just try to like gently shift, just gently shift the, the parameter and see how uh, like it changes the performance of the model. Right. So let's see, is it going to perform uh, uh, like better or worse? I don't fucking know. Let's find out. Let's find out. And it actually started to perform worse. 
So we made them a little worse. What the fuck? So we're gonna get fired tomorrow. All right, let's try to wiggle it in a different direction, maybe. All right, so... Okay. It actually... It actually performed better. What the fuck? Holy shit. What if we, like, continue doing that? It kind of gets better and better. What if we... Okay, okay. What if we automate that process? Right. What if we automate the process? Right. So, essentially, <laughs> one of the things we can do, uh, we can treat cost function as um, sort of like a mathematical function. Right. So, and mathematical functions usually have some sort of optimum, right? So, if you take a look at the a parabola, parabola, right? So, I wonder if I can. Okay, parabola. Mm -hmm. I want to get this thing. All right. Let's imagine that this parabola is our uh, basically cost function. And we are currently somewhere on that parabola. So essentially, if we take the derivative of that function, right, the derivative of the function, uh, it will tell us in which direction the function grows. Lotus rect. <laughs> Shut up. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it will give us the direction in which this entire thing grows. Um, right, and what you have to do, you essentially have to move in the opposite direction. If you move it in the opposite direction of which where the function grows, you're going to be actually moving towards the minimum and you're going to get stuck in there. Right, and that raises the question, how do we get the uh, derivative of this? This is like a for loops and stuff like that. Um, so it, it is possible. We can probably convert it to like a mathematical function with the sum and like differences and stuff like that. Find the derivative of, the, of this entire thing and then just like move in an opposite direction of derivative. But this is just like this is this is a shit for for nerds, right? So we are Chad artificial intelligence bros. That's who we are. We're here to create the startup that's going to be uh, bought by Microsoft. We got no time to this nerdy fucking shit of derivatives. Like, what the fuck is this? Matrices? Derivatives? This is a shit for nerds. What's surprising is actually, by the way, is that in, um, in neural networks, you have to work with matrices and derivatives simultaneously. <laughs> This is such a fucking irony. People keep complaining. Why are we learning all of that in school? Because where do I need that? Literally the most successful discipline on planet Earth involves matrices and derivatives simultaneously. Fucking simultaneously. This is the irony. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're not going to be doing that. Right. So there is a very interesting thing. Um, do you know the definition of derivative? Right, so let's actually find the definition of derivative. Definition of derivative. Right, definition of derivative. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So I wonder, I probably want to use Google. <laughs> so uh, I just want to open Wikipedia. Mm hmm. There we go. This is a very good definition of derivative, if I do say so myself. But no, I didn't come up with that. Right. Essentially, you have this, like, H, right? You have this H. And this is a difference between the input of the function. So here is the, your function, right? And you wiggle the input parameter by H, and you subtract the uh, input parameter without the H. And you divide it by that small wiggle. Right. And what's interesting is that then you drive that small little difference towards zero. And this entire thing basically slowly morphs into the derivatives and basically gives you the, uh, the direction of the function where it is growing. So we literally take 
uh, like the value of the function and divided by like this distance that we traveled with the argument and we get the, the velocity of, of this entire function right and uh, since the function is continuous we have to sort of like drive this distance towards zero right so be because of the continuousness of the function but we are working with computers computers are discrete who said that we have to do that in a mathematical way? What if we literally take our stupid epsilon, right? So literally take our stupid epsilon, right? And I literally code this formula minus this thing without the epsilon and divide it by epsilon. <laughs> And this is the distance of the cost function, which I have to sub subtract from this. <laughs> I can't imagine like an actual AI or like specialist or mathematicians in the chat fucking just screaming at me like what the fuck are you doing you fucking stupid software developer what the fuck is this shit in fact it is a well-known method called finite difference a finite difference right this is not something that is actually used in machine learning. Keep in mind, right? So this is not something that you want to do, but this is something that you can you can do when you're learning, right? Because we are trying to understand what exactly we are trying to achieve, right? What exactly we're trying to achieve. We have a function. We're trying to find the where the function is at zero, at its uh, at its minimum, right? So how we can do that? We can look left. We can look right. Where is the best? Uh, where is the best uh, direction? Let's go in that direction. Let's keep going in that direction. You can do that in different ways, uh, right? But this is not the most optimal way. So this is called finite differences, right? Mm, so finite, and it, here it is, literally, <laughs> right? So finite difference is a mathematical expression of the form of something like this, roughly, uh, right? So and it's usually used for uh, approximation of derivatives, right? So if you don't like derivatives, right? If you were traumatized by educational system and don't like derivatives, you can approximate them very easily, uh, right? And uh, it actually kind of works even on functions that are not differentiable. But don't quote me on that. I don't know anything about math mathematics, right? So because uh, you don't even need to know the structure of the function. Usually, if you want to take a derivative of the function, you just like look up this cheat sheet of different like functions and what how the derivative looks like. In in this case, you can just like plug different values to the function and find the difference and divide it by the uh, by the epsilon. And you're good to go. You approximate it kind of. And uh, the smaller uh, your epsilon becomes, the better approximation you have, right? So, and uh, yeah, let's actually see. Uh, let's actually see what is going to happen, right? So here is the cost function uh, before we update it, uh, like with uh, d cost, right? And this is after. Uh, did the cost function improve, right? Did the cost function improve? No. It actually became worse. <laughs> I wonder why, though. Uh, I wonder why, though. Uh, and it's probably let's actually try to uh, to print this entire value and see. Maybe it's actually huge. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's actually huge. D cost. Actually, yeah, we're supposed to do plus. I mean, it right. So we're supposed to do plus. Uh, but let's print it nonetheless. So th that was the problem. The problem is that I put minus in here, but uh, it's supposed to be plus usually. Right, but uh, let's take a look at that thing one more time. So the cost is uh, 61, right? So that kind of should work, but it's too huge, right? You see, it's kind of too huge. So uh, you're going to be jumping around too much if you try to do this kind of stuff, right? So it's, it doesn't really doesn't really work that well, uh, right? And the thing that people usually do in machine learning, they introduce, yeah, people already guessed it, yeah, they introduce a thing called learning rate. Because even if you use derivatives, right, even if you use derivatives for this kind of thing, uh, right, they're going to be, their actual values are still going to be too, too, too big for just driving your value towards, towards zero. They're still going to be too big. You want to kind of like, um, you know, make them smaller so they don't overshoot or anything like that. And the rate, we can set the rate to also very small value, like a 1000th. Uh, and here's the fun part. Here's the fun part of uh, machine learning. There is a, a lot of magical values like that. There is a lot. 
and basically doing machine learning, artificial intelligence, and stuff like that, is just like playing with this magical number until the data looks right. <laughs> XKCD even has a, like a comic on that. Like, XKCD uh, machine learning. <laughs> Do you guys remember? <laughs> Uh, I, I guess that's the one, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, this is basically like a pile of linear algebra and stuff like that. This is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start look right. So <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you're gonna be doing, and you won't believe this is not even a joke. That's literally how you do that, right? That's literally how you do that. And what's funny is that this is the fact that when you work with uh, like ChatGPT or any, you know, um, models that generate art and something like that, they not always work uh, right away, right? And if they don't work, what you usually do, you just try again until they kind of produce the reasonable result. The fact that you work with these artificial intelligence models like that is not coincidental because that thing stems from the fundamentals of the approach in the first place. It is fundamental to machine learning to just like fuck around until it works right. And that's why the results also end up like that, right? ChatGPT gives you something that looks right, but not quite right. And you just try again and it stems from the fundamental, right? It go goes from, from the bottom of this entire thing, right? <laughs> but what's funny is that when it starts to look right, it kind of works. That's what's surprising about it, right? Mm-hmm. -mm. Which is why it's not good for people for uh, that have no idea about the subject. Yeah, that's that's very dangerous, right? So to use this kind of stuff effectively, you kind of need to know what you're doing, right? Unfortunately, but at the same time, this thing encourages you not to know what you're doing, which is a very dangerous thing. But anyway, so uh, okay, so essentially uh, that improved the cost function. And what's interesting is that if we will need to move in a different direction, this particular formula will take into uh, that into account automatically. It will just take that into account automatically. That's the beauty of it. And now, what if we just repeat this process two times? Right, we, we did it once. Well, let's repeat it two times. Right, why not? Uh, let's see what's going to happen. Uh, okay. Ah! the fuck is going on? Uh, actually, it's supposed to... All right. Yeah, don't go. So it, it decreased even more, right? It decreased even more. What if we do that, I don't know, five times? It decreased even more. What if we continue 10 times? What if we do 100 times? It keeps decreasing. So our model start to, starts to perform better and better and better. What if we continue? How about 200s? Okay, not bad. What about 300s? It's almost zero. Let's continue. 500 times. It's basically zero. Okay, so let's uh, train it for 500 iterations. Uh, let's train for 500 iterations and print the value of W. It's basically two. So, so we successfully trained our model, I would even say not just model, our neural network with a single neuron without using any uh, fancy frameworks, without using Python, TensorFlow or GPU, just using C. We just trained our single last cell brain. <laughs> Oh, this is a perfect title for a, for a stream. Training my last brain cell. <laughs> ah, training my last brain cell. Oh. Yeah, perceptron. So, almost. We didn't get to the perceptron, but as you can see, it's it's not exactly... So, the, the actual uh, model here, uh, the actual thing in here is... Like, W has to be equal to 2. 
it was obvious obvious from the start right it was obvious from the start but we sort of pretended that we didn't know that right so we sort of pretended that we didn't know that uh right and it actually goes towards uh to, towards two so here's an interesting thing uh okay so we can um, print the cost. Let's actually say that the cost is equal to that and lots also along with the cost let's print the, the value of the model and see how it sort of approaches to. Right, so I can uh, I can print it like that. Alright, so we can clearly see. So it started from 7. Right, it started from 7 and it was going down to 2. But what if it started below 2? Right, what if we started below 2? What if instead of this thing uh, we had uh, something like 1? Would it still work? Yeah. It started from 1 and it started to approach 2, uh, but it never fully approached it because we didn't fully train it, but it's still approaching 2. So it is approaching this solution. It is approaching this solution. Right. And um, so what's interesting is that here, this particular cost function is, is very simple. But in case of more data, Right. If you have more different data, the cost function becomes even more complicated and it can have multiple optimal solutions. Right. So and uh, here is the thing. Sometimes where you start. Right. So here we start from a random number. Uh, sometimes where you start is very important very important because depending on where you start you may end up at different optimal solutions and that's why uh, quite often the mathematical model is randomized it's it's randomized so if it didn't work one time and we're gonna observe that by the way uh, you know today if we have enough time uh, if it didn't work out you can just rerun it from a different place you know the classical just stir the pile of linear algebra until it looks right so if it didn't work first time you can just Try it another time in a different state. Ah, oh, until it works out. So, <clears throat> uh, okay, guys. So, and because of that, we kind of want to, uh, you know, do these kind of things. Um, what's funny is that uh, whatever we have in here, uh, actually, roughly, uh, where is the? I, I think it's in the cost function. Uh, it roughly fits the definition of the single artificial neural uh, neuron, single artificial uh, neuron, or perceptron. I think this is how it's called, uh, right? So it's a perceptron. Uh, perceptron, right? So let's actually Google that. <clears throat> mm, perceptron. Uh, I think, right? A single one. No, it's not the. Uh, let's try a different query. Let's try a different prompt. Uh, I think artificial uh, neuron. Yeah, a single neuron. Not neural, but neuron. Uh huh. I need a picture. I need a picture. There we go. There was a better picture. Uh, just let me do use a Google. Uh, it should be illegal to build brains. Oh, this this is a better one. Finally, Google is better than DuckDuckGo. Uh, Google is better than DuckDuckGo. Uh, can I can I open it? Can Can you just open it? There we go. Fine. Towards data science. I just want a picture. Can, can I have a picture? I, I don't know what the fuck is going on and why everything is so slow to me. I just want a single picture. Finally, thank you so much. Can I can I just open it? Yeah, it's just like this website, they're killing me, right? It's, the image itself is actually very fast to load. It's just like the front ends are so fucking slow. Anyway, so essentially, okay, I'm, I'm sorry for, for, for the lag. Uh, right, so yeah. That's that's better. So a neural uh, neuron, uh, artificial neuron, uh, actually have like several inputs, several axes, right? And they go towards this neuron. And what it does, it actually sums them up, but it sums them up with a certain weight. So each connection for the input has a certain weight. Uh, and essentially, if you have uh, several inputs like x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth, and each input is connected with a weight, 
W1, W2, W3, and weight is effectively how strong this connection. So what the neuron does, it basically sums them up by multiplying by the weights, right? So it's going to be X1 multiplied by w, uh, W1 plus X2 multiplied by W2 plus X3 multiplied by W3 uh, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So you can effectively think about our model as a single artificial neuron with a single input and a single connection. So on top of uh, like have, having several connection, uh, neurons usually also have uh, something called bias. And bias is an additional thing that sort of like shifts the value of the neuron, like the entire value of the neuron, like to, to the left or to the right, to the negative value or to the positive value uh, or something like that. And it's not dependent on the inputs. Right, so it's one value that is usually not dependent on the input. I, I don't really understand what its purpose, but apparently people say that it's important to have uh, a bias because it just improves the performance of the neural networks in general. Right, so you can think of it as like B, and essentially how you use it, you just like add it to, to the entire sum. Right, so yeah. So you can think about our model of y equal x multiplied by w as just like a single uh, neuron, uh, single neuron with a single connection, uh, with the weight of that connection w, and with the bias equal being equal to zero. So by bias is equal to zero. So this is basically that. Uh, we could have introduced the bias in here, right? We could have introduced the bias, like so, and now our model have two parameters, right? So it has two parameters, which we can also try to uh, to train, right? So we can initially start with the bias also equal to maybe something like five, uh, right? And here, one of the things we'll have to do, right? So here, as you can see, we um, basically find the difference when we mo uh, modify the weight, but we're gonna keep the bias as usual. So that gives us the expected difference in the DW, in, in the weight. Uh, right, and then we can try to modify the bias as well, right? And that gives us the uh, the difference, the expected like difference uh, for the bias. And effectively, what we did in here, we computed a gradient of the two-dimensional function, right? So, <laughs> but let's not talk about that because this is a shit for nerds. And essentially, uh, we're just moving uh, both of the parameters uh, towards in here, right? So I, I'm not sure if it's useful in any way, but this is just like an additional parameter that our model can modify if it wants to, right? So maybe it will find configuration on w, of W and B uh, that performs well. I don't freaking know. So let's actually, uh, the, the beauty of this thing is that we can just like give it a bunch of parameters and let it go. Just like do whatever you want. Just find the configuration, whatever configuration, right? So double the amount of parameters. Yeah. <laughs> So we're already getting closer to GPT-4, right? So before, right, we had this kind of stuff, right? So this is GPT-4 uh, and this is our model. We added additional parameters, so we're getting closer to GPT-4. Uh, so <laughs> open, open AI is literally shaking right now. Uh, they're shivering, right? So we're getting to them. We're getting to them anyway. Uh, we're doubling the amount of parameters. <laughs> right. <clears throat> mm, okay, so, and, uh, yeah, so we, we have to call it, uh, when we call the cost, we have to actually pass uh, this entire thing everywhere. Uh, yeah. So here we're computing the cost function, the original cost function, uh, two times, which is a little bit wasteful. Uh, speaking about, like, optimal solution, right? I'm using finite differences, but anyway. Uh, I want to kind of save. Uh, this entire thing to to here, All right? So I'm going to put it in here. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So and in here we are constantly computing the cost function. There we go. So uh, yeah, I mean, why not? So we we started with the weight uh, this and bias zero, which is kind of weird, isn't it? Supposed to be yeah. That's that's absolutely weird. I think bias. Uh, I think I just didn't print it. Yeah, yeah. I think I just didn't print it, so that's the problem here. Yeah. So we started with the weight 8 and bias 1, and it just like started to decrease until the bias became negative and becomes more and more negative. And it just like, yeah. So you have 2 with a little bit of a fractional part, and bias ends up just subtracting part of that fractional part. So it doesn't really do anything useful. 
uh, but overall, right, it may help your neural network. So I heard, I'm not an artificial intelligence person. I don't fucking know how this entire shit works, but anyway. So cool, that's pretty cool. Uh, we have <clears throat> a neural network with a single neuron. So let's maybe try to model something with a single neuron, but two inputs. That would have been kind of interesting, I think. But we will do that. I think we need to make a small break uh, because I've been uh, slapping the could for one hour and I think uh, I need to make a cup of tea. I ran out of tea. So uh, just a second. I need to acknowledge one of the subs. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Omega Sad Life, for uh, the four months of tier one subscription with a message. Have you eaten traditional Neapolitan pizza? I wish. Oh my god, you just like, how did you know? Do you like hacked my computer for the past several months? Uh, I've been watching on YouTube videos about traditional Neapolitan pizza and holy shit, I want to try that. So, <laughs> but unfortunately, I, I can't travel to Italy for that. So the only way I can get that is I can try to make it myself. But for a proper traditional Neapolitan pizza, I probably have to have like a, you know, like a stove like or some sort of a dome like it's, it's kind of difficult because like how you you cook that you have to cook it under intense heat very very quickly uh but, but maybe we can have we, we can maybe there is some pizza places in here in siberia where i can try to find that but yeah i never tried it but i really want to i really want to because from what i heard from what i saw how it's prepared how it's done it must be freaking amazing and what i like about it it's it's simplicity that's what I like. This is actually something that I like about the entirety of Italian cuisine. So because the Italian cuisine fascinates me extremely uh, because all of the dishes in Italian cuisine are dead simple. They're all dead simple, but they're just like reduced to their like essence and perfection. And that's, I think that's what makes the Italian cuisine so influential and so famous, right? It's just like simplicity, but at the same time, they just like remove everything that is not important and condense it to the actual essence of what makes it good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, like I never tried it, but I want to, I really want to, maybe I will someday. Anyway, what I want you to do, I want you to make a small break, right? So let's make a small break and um, so let's train a more complicated uh, brain cell <laughs> right so the one that accepts two inputs the one that accepts two inputs i'm gonna actually draw it myself this time uh right right right, right. so uh the one that we had before uh was essentially something like this so this is our brain cell so i'm gonna put uh, the sigma in here to indicate that it's a sum uh and uh the input was here so it had the weight uh, the input was X and the output was uh, basically W, right? So that's a very simple brain cell. Let's try to experiment with the brain cells, right? The brain cells that have two inputs, right? So uh, it's going to be X1, right? And the second input is going to be X2. And the weights, it's also need to have two weights, right? It was also going to have two weights. Uh, and uh, should it have any biases? We can introduce biases, right? But they kind of obscure what exactly uh, their um, like the the brain cell is doing in our specific case, right? Because our goal right now is to like learn things. So I think I'm not going to add any biases for this one as well. So what such thing can model? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe um, uh, some different circuit elements, like uh, OR gates, right? OR gates and AND gates. Right, because they actually kind of fit perfectly, like OR gates and AND gates fit perfectly into this definition, right? It's a single element that just basically uh, takes two inputs and produces one uh, like output. And it's super easy to come up with the training set for such a brain cell. So let's actually try to model these kind of things. Uh, another thing uh, we can try to model uh, is XOR gate, but people who know anything about <laughs> about uh you know neural networks will uh will know that you can't uh, model sor gate uh with a single brain cell right and this is something interesting about sor gates you actually need more brain cells to actually model sor right but we'll get to that we'll get to that <laughs> let's try to uh, uh like a very simple uh neural network with a single brain cell but two inputs 
right? Let's not ramp up the difficulty of our model too quickly, right? Let's not do that. Uh, okay, so I kind of want to preserve this example as it is because I think it's kind of cool uh, by itself. So I think I'm going to create a separate maybe file for the OR gates and end gates and stuff like that. So I'm going to remove main and I'm going to replace this thing to uh, maybe twice, right? So this is going to be twice. So this is a very simple brain cell that doubles the its input, right? It just doubles it, its input and that's basically what it does, uh, right? So here I'm going to just say, okay, twice, um, there we go. And let's create another example, uh, right? And we're gonna have gates, right? Uh -huh. Gates.c. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna do include stdh. Maybe I'm gonna actually copy some stuff from here, uh, right? So, what kind of training set are we going to have, for example, for the OR gate, right? So, OR gate. Uh, so I suppose what we can do, we can have an array of triples. The first two elements of uh, the triple are going to be the inputs of, of this entire thing, right? So for instance, zero, zero. And the third one is going to be the output, right? So if you have uh, one and zero, the result must be one. Uh, then if you have zero, one, the result must be one. And if you have one, one, the result must be one. So this is an OR gate. Uh, or <laughs> gate. Uh, cool. So the cost function is going to be basically the same, almost, right? It's going to be basically the same, but we have two inputs now, right? So we have two inputs. So we have input like x1 and x2, right? And they're coming from uh, train i0 and train uh, one i01, train i1. So, and uh, the model itself has two weights. Right, so it has two weights, uh, W1 and W2, right? And how we're applying them, we just take X1, W1 plus X2, W2, and here is the result. And we are finding the difference between that actual result and the expected and just add uh, all of that up to, uh, to the cost function. And there you go, we've, we've got the cost function. Uh, right, so let's actually create an entry point and create uh, initial model, right? So it's going to be two weights in here, weight one and weight two, and they're random. Uh, so that requires the random float. So let me copy paste this thing in here. There we go. So we've got a random thing here. That's pretty cool. Uh, so let's fixate this thing to uh, one specific seed and let's take a look at our beautiful, beautiful model. Let's take a look at it. Uh -huh. Let's gaze upon it in all its beauty. Uh, I'm going to just do that and gates. Cool. So this is the model. This is its initial weights. How well does it even perform? Uh, right. How well does it even perform? Let's find out. Right. So we're going to compute the cost. Cost uh, W1, W2. And let's take a look at it. C equal this, uh, like so. That's the cost. Does it perform well? Not really. Not really, though. Mm, it, though it's close. It can actually get pretty close, right? Uh, so <clears throat> can we drive that entire cost down? So essentially, we need to compute things like uh, DW1, right? So this is going to be basic plus epsilon. Uh, minus this original cost divided by epsilon uh, and we can repeat that for for the second thing in here so this one is just one uh, right. we're just like trying to wiggle both of the parameters we're right? just wiggling both of the parameters and then uh, we are updating all this entire stuff so minus rate multiplied by w1 and then uh, could replace one two uh, there we go so and <clears throat> that should improve the cost so here we can just print uh, this entire cost so this is gonna be let's put it this way uh, i'm gonna print that and then c f i'm gonna put c in here and we're gonna repeat that a couple of times right so very simple training uh, process a couple of times and that should work out at the end of the day all right so it's going to work. It doesn't really compile because we didn't define 
uh, epsilon and rate. So let's actually take epsilon and rate from this twice example, right? So this is they are, okay. You can copy paste them directly, epsilon and rate. So we're gonna have, uh, okay. So did the cost decrease? Okay, the cost decreased, the cost decreased. So that, that means it kind of works. Uh, all right, let's repeat that 100 times. Uh, is it going to, yeah, it keeps decreasing, but not really that fast. Not as fast as I would like to, so maybe 500. Uh, right, it's it's decreasing, all right. So it is in fact decreasing. That's that's kind of cool. So what about thousand? What about thousand of times? Uh, all right. So I'm starting to hit actually a very interesting problem. Is that uh, the like Emacs is not a very good terminal, right? That's kind of the problem, right? So and the entire uh, training process. Uh, may be stalled just by the uh, latency of the terminal. So it would be better to actually run this entire thing in your XVT, right? So it's going to be a little bit faster. So let me switch to here, uh, right? And I'm going to just be rebuilding everything and just running this thing in here. So as you can see, it's a little bit faster, right? It's it's a little bit faster in the, in the terminal. Uh, okay, so what if I put 2000s, right? What if it's 2000s? Uh, yeah, it's it's going slower, but maybe we can increase the rate what if we increase the rate a little bit so this is yet another phase of just like stirring this shit around until it kind of works <clears throat> until it, oh, well, I mean, yeah so there's an a in here until it kind of works and uh yeah so i think yeah and here is an interesting thing <laughs> this thing starts to sort of like oscillate right this thing starts to oscillate uh, right, and this is a very interesting situation. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, it's just like too, uh, like too big of a step, right? It is too big of a step, uh, and it's kind of kind of dangerous for that. So you, you can't really do that. So what if we reduce the step, but uh, like twice of that? Uh, yeah, it's not really um, slowing down any further. One of the things uh, that uh, neural networks do, right? Uh, that, yeah, chat already. <laughs> chat already spamming about that. One of the things that uh, neural networks do, they actually have uh, at the end of them, uh, right, at the end of the neurons, uh, something called activation function, right? So on top of like just summing up uh, all of the inputs and the, uh, the weights, they also apply an activation function, F. Right, and what's the purpose of activation function? So, what, uh, like after you summed up all of the inputs and all of the weights and biases, you may end up with completely unbound value that goes like around and stuff like that. And what the activation functions are trying to do, they're trying to sort of like squish and sort of like, um, you know, um, isolate that value. Uh, quite often, uh, people use a, uh, the, uh, a function called sigmoid as an activation function. And it's actually a very convenient function. Uh, it's actually a very convenient function. It's not... <laughs> Freaking duck, duck, go. <laughs> anyway, so uh, they're trying to sort of like tell us that it's shit, probably. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so it's a really cool function because it maps value from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, to zero to one right so that's what it does L look look at that so it's the uh, its value is from zero to one but the more you go to minus infinity to minus infinity the, the closer it becomes to zero the more you go to plus infinity the more it goes towards one and it's just like takes any value and it just squishes it and maps it exactly to from zero to one and it's actually very useful and it kind of fits perfectly uh to our you know purpose because here we're trying to model an end gate and uh, the inputs and outputs of the end gate is probably going to be zero and one so maybe we can just slap the uh, slap the sigmoid on, on top of our model and see whether it improves anything or doesn't improve anything. I don't know. Uh, so these days, uh, people, yeah, quite often use uh, ReLU function, ReLU, right? And it's actually way simpler than sigmoid. So it's just like allows 
the value to grow indefinitely but it doesn't allow to grow like down so it basically cuts off all the negative values and the reason why people use that is kind of like uh, outside of the topic of today's stream, right? So if from what I heard on the internet, right? From what I heard on the internet, it's really important uh, when you're doing deep learning along with using backpropagation, right? So if you're stacking a lot of layers of the neural network, right? And you're using backpropagation to speed up the computing of the gradient, it's very important to use ReLU, right? To sort of avoid the vanishing of the gradient. This is how I understood it, right? Uh, so, but this is kind of outside of the scope of today's stream, right? It's, so, it's like a lot of technicalities, uh, right? So, which I don't really want <clears throat> to go into right now because we're not some freaking nerds. We're AI ML chat bros. That's who we are. And all of these derivatives and like functions is just for nerds, not for us. That's why I'm not going to go into that today. So, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh we've got some subs we'll get some subs uh thank you so much noob uh 3 14 15 i suppose noob pi for uh twitch prime subscription with the message a uh, one thank you thank you thank you thank you math views i hope i pronounced your name correctly i'm not sure if i did but thank you so much for twitch prime for two months thank you thank you thank you really appreciate that so yeah uh, so, yeah, so there, there are different uh, activation functions that you can use and uh, to pick one, you kind of need to understand the purpose of them and what exactly kind of problems they introduce and what kind of problems they solve. Uh, right. So on the surface, this entire area like of machine learning, artificial intelligence is rather simple, right? So you have a model, you have a cost function, you can like tweak around the parameters and your goal is just to minimize the, uh, the cost function and that it, that's it. Right. But on how you can do that and how to do that efficiently, that's where, you know, a lot of different interesting details start to pop up and the whole sort of area of research emerges. Uh, right. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, go. So, okay, let's actually slap the sigmoid function on top of the entire model. So let's actually uh, code is the sigmoid function. So I'm going to call it sig uh, f. Right, so uh, so F usually in C indicates that uh, you know uh, that we're working with floats, right? I need to, to actually put it like a full one, yeah. Uh, sigmoid F uh, because usually in C you have functions like cosine, sine, uh, sqrt, and by default uh, in standard C, uh, C library they all work with doubles, right? So they all accept doubles. And if you want to work with floats, right, you have to use this variant of the functions uh, that have a suffix f. So this is sort of like a more or less standard naming in C. And I kind of like to follow it when I define uh, de define mathematical functions like that, right? So I think it does make sense. Okay, so uh, what we can do, we can just like code this specific formula, right? So uh, exponent minus x, right? So basically uh, 1 divided by 1 plus uh, exponent minus x so plus exp f minus x there we go so that's that's the formula uh, that's the entire formula and uh, let me take a look xp f yeah this is not how we do that i'm supposed to use man uh, exp f Yo, there we go. So as you can see, exp by itself works with doubles, uh, and xpf works with floats. There's also L version with uh, which works with long doubles. Look at that, long doubles. You have to also link with uh, lm, uh, which actually forces us to change our compilation script, right? So this is the first time we're using mathematical library. We're using mathematical library literally for one single function that I don't want to code myself right now. <laughs> Right, but that's what we're doing. So, and essentially, how we're going to split all of that? Since we're just using finite difference, right? We're not using like actual gradient descent or anything like that, where we have to compute the derivative of this entire function, which is not actually that hard, especially if you're using just like one layer. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Like with one layer, you don't even have to use backpropagation. I'm really sorry for all of that stupid nerdy shit. Uh, I'm going to stop. But yeah. Uh, so sigmoid f 
uh, and we just slap it in here and that is going to limit the values of like everything to zero and one uh, okay, so let's actually take a look at how um, <clears throat> exactly uh, sigmoid works. It's actually rather interesting. So I'm going to uh, end the program in here and I'm going to just iterate through some values. So let's actually iterate through uh, minus 10, minus 10 F uh, up until plus 10 F and we're going to add one, right? Something like that. And what I want to see is basically this thing. Right. Uh, so here's the X and here is the sigmoid X. Right. And we'll also put uh, new lines in here. Uh, build gates. There we go. So it uh, complained about this thing. This is because it doesn't have any declarations of this function. Let's include math. Uh, and there we go. So we have the range from minus 10 to plus 10. Right. But it's still from zero to one. And it doesn't matter uh, how big of a range it is. It like literally doesn't matter. You can iterate from minus 100 to plus 100. And let's actually in this case make a step 10 so it doesn't like consume everything on the screen. Uh, and it's still gonna be from zero to one. It, it literally doesn't care, right? So it basically stops at one around, but it's just like flow doesn't have enough precision to show that it's going to, it's less than one as far as i know it never uh, actually reaches the one it just basically approaches one indefinitely right that's how it works i think i'm, I'm not a mathematician so i'm a uga booga software developer uh so yeah so and in here it infinitely approaches zero uh which is kind of cool right so just like between zero and one uh so uh, let me see. So that changes the model completely, right? So that changes the model completely. And let's see how it behaves now, right? How it behaves now. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And it kind of, yeah, it kind of reduces, but not too much. But maybe now, since we're sort of limiting everything, maybe it will make it easy to uh, increase the rate. Yeah, so we can now increase the rate. Uh, so let me increase the size. What about thousand? Uh, right. So what about thousand? Uh -huh. It's a, yeah. Okay. So it actually, yeah. Okay. Uh, so what about two thousand? Uh, I should stop uh, running this entire thing in Emacs and just let it do it in here. Okay. So what if I also decrease the epsilon? Right. Uh, I think it's it's a little bit faster, but what we want to do is probably like maybe five thousands in here, right? Maybe even more. Uh, so I suppose now I can actually increase. It keep it keeps decreasing. So what about ten thousands? Fifty uh, thousands. Okay, but what's funny is that it slows down, but it keeps decreasing anyway. Uh, so can I push it further? Uh, I suppose, what if I make the epsilon like smaller? Uh-huh. Yeah. So what if I don't print anything? What if I don't print anything and I'm gonna say, okay, make a million of iterations, right? And then print the final result in here, All right? So uh, hopefully, so in the cost in here has to be cost W1, uh, W2. Right, so let's actually do that. And let's wait a little bit. Uh, cost is still kind of scheisse. Uh, what about the epsilon? Mm -hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> he used German powers. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me let me see let me see. So I don't think increasing this entire stuff is going to uh, work in any way. So it's still rather. Does it even does it even increase or decrease or anything like that? Uh, uh huh. So let's print this entire stuff. Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's decreasing, but it, ta it takes too much time to actually go anywhere, unfortunately. It takes a lot of time to go anywhere. And it slows down over time. Mm -mm -mm. It slows down uh, over time. So maybe we should... Oh, yeah. Here's another interesting thing. So maybe we're simply starting not from a good initial state. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Hmm? Maybe that's the problem. What if we just uh, do this thing randomly? Like, we start randomly every time. Right. So, uh, welcome to, to Machine Learning, by the way. Uh, okay, so... Stir it up, yes, yeah, stir it up. Is it is it improving over time? Is it actually improving? Uh, though, let me double check that I didn't make any mistakes in here. Uh, so this is uh, one, so this is supposed to be zero. Um, so this is three. Okay, so I need to, I really need to double check that I, I'm not making any mistakes. For sure, for sure. So this is a training, this is difference between these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so what if I, I don't think swapping this stuff matters per se. Right, because it's gonna be if it's gonna be negative, it's gonna be fine anyway. So then we just do train. So this is fine. Random float. We can actually like multiply maybe uh, by ten and subtract five and give it a little bit bigger range. Right, give it a little bit bigger range. Uh, and somewhere around here, what we're doing, we're just uh, yeah subtracting that, subtracting that. So this is the cost. Everything seems to be fine. Uh, and this should work more or less. So let's give it a more, more try. Uh -huh. So it feels like it starts from the same thing. Let me, let me do one iteration just to see where it starts from. Uh, does it start from different places? Yeah, it does start from different places, which is good. Uh, right. So, which is actually good. Uh huh. So, let's do the sound of these things. Mm -hmm. One of the things we probably also want to do, maybe uh, we don't really need uh, all of that stuff. Mm -mm, Sigmoid is used in cost. Uh, try using a different cost function. I don't think, uh, yeah, this cost function should be fine in my opinion. Right, it should be, it should be fine in fact. One of the things I want to do, by the way, uh, after we ended the training, right, after we ended the training, I want to actually iterate uh, through the data, right, through the training data. Or maybe we can just uh, do the following iteration, less than two, uh, plus plus i. Uh, and just do J and see how well that thing performs. Uh, right, so this is going to be ZU. Uh, so this is OR, right? So that means we can do OR uh, and then equal to F, right? And let's just forward this entire thing. Let's just forward this entire thing like so. So, but in this case, uh, this is I and this is J, right? So this is I and this is J and see if it like performs well. Like how exactly does it perform? Maybe, maybe it performs fine. Uh, so I, J, uh -huh, uh -huh. and that's already kind of okay, believe it or not. Right, so even though the cost function doesn't become 100% uh, zero, look at that. I mean, on zero, zero, it's like uh, equal to have, but where it's supposed to be one, it is actually closer to one. Right, it would be better to train it a little bit more, right? It would be better to train it a little bit more, like maybe 10,000 times, if you know what I mean? Uh, right, to drive down this specific thing, uh, right, even better. But for some reason, that specific case doesn't really go well. 
it doesn't really go well. I don't really know why. Uh, right, so we can try to do it. Yeah. For some reason, it's stacked for this 0, 5. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. So if we try, uh, for instance, 100 of these things, is it going to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, there we go. Mm, because sigmoid zero is ah yeah mm -hmm. sigmoid zero is half it is always half you know what that actually means that we have to sigmoid axis as well that is very interesting point oh you know yeah that basically means that we can only initialize this stuff from zero to one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, that's the only thing we can do now. Mm -hmm. No, it's still not. Mm -hmm. mm, and I suppose we can try to... Well, I mean, this... Huh. Maybe you can add a bias. Let's try to add a bias. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Let's add a bias. Uh, right. Maybe that's why you need a bias, by the way. Maybe we're about to uh, find out something very important about neural networks and why exactly you need to have a bias. Uh, right. So... So you can offset things around. Yeah, so... Um, and bias could be a minus half. Yeah, that's actually a good point. That's actually a good point. Uh, but it's we, we're going to let the model to discover all of that, right? So we're going to let the model to do that. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be the bias. Uh, db. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Bf. B, there we go. Almost. Yeah, we have to pass this thing in here. And. Yo, look at that! What the fuck? It's almost zero. And this is the lesson, boys and girls. Why? You, this is the answer why you need to have a bias. Uh, even though it kind of. Yeah. So it performed better, but it still have a half in here. Uh, all right, so we can try to do even more. All right, so bias kind of works out. Oh, I didn't add... Okay, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to add the bias in the forwarding. So maybe it makes sense to have a separate function, which is called forward, right? Where you specify the, the model, right? And I mean... It's kind of it's kind of stupid function would be right. So we don't really have that complicated of a thing, uh, right? That complicated of a thing to actually introduce such functions. So let's actually let it be. Look how fast it actually uh, approaches zero. Like look at that uh, column, right? So this is the column. I'm not sure if the encoding allows you to see that, but this is so cool, uh, right? And look at that. This is or. This is literally or. You can even use like half as an indicator so if the value of the neuron is less than half that means it's zero if it's more than half that means it's one and it found the configuration that acts like or right it acts like or uh do a graph um let's let's give it a try sure uh one of the things we can do uh right so let's uh, let's see so I can spend a lot of time uh, coding something that would uh, show the graph, but one of the things we can do, one of the things we can do is we can just dump the cost function, right? And uh, we can just save it to cost txt, right? And then using GNU plot, uh, we can plot uh, cost txt with lines, right? So with lines. Uh, there we go. So we can kind of I'm not sure if you can see that, but yeah. So can I increase? I can't increase that, but 
uh, here it is right oh i can probably zoom it my zoom in myself right so this is how it started it started from here and it dropped very quickly um to here around 10,000 i suppose yeah around 10,000 iterations so it's a, this is the amount of iterations and this is the cost function right so that uh, drive it and then it started to slow down more and more and more and more it's sort of like a it looks like one over x kind of it kind of looks like one over x so this is basically how the the cost function was decreasing or something uh right it would be kind of cool right it would be kind of cool if this was actually a graphical application that start start up the window like maybe at like sdl window and like draws this uh, cost uh, function in real time as it learns that would have been actually kind of cool but that might take like an entire like separate stream coding this entire system so that's why i don't do that uh all right so i know that the the chat python developers already have all of that and they can do all of that in a like a jupiter um jupiter notebook but i have a muxiphobia <laughs> I can't use Jupyter Notebooks, I have a moxiphobia. <laughs> Do you guys know what is a moxiphobia? Uh, I, I forgot how it's spelled. A moxiphobia. Yeah. Um. It's, a, it's a fear of Jupiters. <laughs> it's a thing. There is a phobia. There is a phobia for Jupiters. Uh, have you seen a Jupiter? Uh, Jupiter. Have you seen a Jupiter? This shit is fucking scary. Like I, I'm gonna show. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you muxophobia. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you muxophobia right now. Uh, do you know that the size of this red, great red spot, is bigger than Earth? Like this little thing on the surface of the Jupiter is bigger than fucking Earth. It, it can devour this entire Earth easy like tell me how you don't have a moxiphobia like i do this shit is fucking scary it's just like this sort of lawcraft lovecraft style like a demon that can devour entire world right and it's nearby it's in the same solar system like it's fucking scary <laughs> now you have moxiphobia anyway you're welcome mm -mm. So yeah. <laughs> oh, N nearby, yeah, yeah, I know it's it's pretty far away. So the, the scale of the solar system is actually bigger than people think, right? So uh, usually the uh, pop science visualizations kind of show things too close to each other. In reality, they are way more far, uh, like far apart. But yeah. Uh, you need a bias because the model without it could not fit the data better. It like fits uh, the um, fit the parabola with the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, okay, I'm gonna explain you how my ooga booga brain understands that. Right. So if you don't have a bias, if you don't have a bias, the model can only uh, modify the um, the output only based on the parameters only based on the parameters but as soon as you add a bias it uh, the model is capable of taking the entire state and shifting it around regardless of the inputs right so this one little parameter doesn't depend on any of the inputs so the learning process can now take this entire thing and move it around left and right this is how my stupid ooga booga brain understands that Right. I, I don't know how to do these fancy words of fitting parameter, regression stuff. I don't understand that. But for me, it's just like simple parameter. And I, it's, if it's negative, I can move this entire thing to the left. And it's positive, I can move this entire thing to the right. If I didn't have that parameter, I couldn't, I won't be able to do that. Uh, Raphael, hello. What's up? What's up? So yeah, for me, it's like this sort of like offset. So I, I do understand that, like, I'm a stupid developer, don't understand, like, these uh, high-level mathematical things, but this is how I understand it, right? Maybe it's too simplistic. Um... Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anyway, here's an interesting thing, and this is where the cool part comes in. 
very cool part that actually even scares me a little bit. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. So, uh, so it's not that dramatic as I'm going to show it. But yeah, okay. So here's the ore, right? Here's the ore part. Uh, now, I'm going to go to my cost function and I'm going to say, okay, uh, let's actually change the data. What if instead of or, I want end? So in case of an end, I'm going to do it like that, right? Uh, and we're going to try to train it for a little bit. And this the flipper acts like end now. I never explicitly told it to be or or end. I just coded a, like a description of the behavior of this element. And it just like, like um, tweaked parameters around and it came up with a thing that acts like that. So it's, it's a very simple thing, right? It's a very simple thing. Uh, but I never set up any of this configuration myself. I just explain it what I want and sort of like a portal from other dimension appeared and this element that I wanted appeared out of that portal. Right. I only said, I want that. And it's just like, it, it found it here. This, this is what you wanted. This is probably what you wanted. There you go. This is so fascinating. But at, at the same time, it's not always going to be exactly what you want. Right. It's like uh, asking a uh, genie to grant you wishes, if you know what I mean. Right. If you're fucked up anywhere in your description of, of your wish, the genie is going to fuck you. That's right. So... <laughs> So genies are actually very, very wild, vile creatures, right? So they're gonna take, they're gonna rule lawyer your wish to their advantage. And this is what these machine learning algorithms are. They're like genius, right? So you, you, be, you have to be very careful with what you're asking for. Uh, yeah. So we can also try to train this entire thing for other things, right? So as far as I know, it can even do uh, NAND gate, right? So this is like, um, this is AND gate. So we can also do NAND gate, right? And NAND gate is basically AND, but all of these things are inverted, right? So you can essentially uh, just invert this entire thing, uh, right? And it still will be able to, to actually model that. Right, as you can see, it, it modeled that. So this is the end, NAND gate now, right? So it's end, but uh, with negated. So the fun part starts when you ask it, okay, what about Zor? Zor is a very cool, uh, you know, very cool um, gate. C can I model that? So with the zeros, it's zero. If one of them is one, it's going to be one. When both of them are one, it's going to be zero. So you can think about Zor actually adding up two numbers, right? So here uh, is the sum of the numbers, right? Z uh, zero plus zero is zero. One plus zero is one. Zero plus one is one. One plus one is going to be two. But the last digit, the overflow digit, uh, got basically thrown away, right? So we, we threw away the, the overflow digit and we only left with this thing. So it's just like overflown. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a sum of a, of a single, uh, of a single bit. All right. So we're going to try to do this entire thing and it didn't really find anything. Maybe we, we just need to run it more. Let's actually take a look at how it evolves, All right? How it evolves. So let me see. Uh, and it kind of stagnates at, at, at the quarter of the, or here is the cost function. It kind of stagnates at the quarter, right? It, it kept decreasing the. Uh, the weights, right, and it didn't really go anywhere. And no matter how many times you uh, actually try to do that, you basically will get stuck at nothing. And this is because, uh, as far as I know, Zor element is not modelable by a single neuron, right? A single neuron is not enough to model a uh, Zor element, right? So this is because. <clears throat> Again, I'm a stupid Uga Booga developer, right? I'm a stupid Uga Booga developer. But as far as I know, um, so a single neuron, a single neuron can basically classify things on two sides of the line, right? Because what it does, it just like models a single line, right? So, but Zor has the like values on different parts. Like it, it's not enough to 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 classify uh, Zor like that. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I still don't understand why you can't do, do Zor with a single neuron. 
So yeah, maybe we can Google that app. Uh, Zor with Zor neural network with a single uh, neuron. Right. That's the right intuition, though. Oh, thank you. So we don't have to Google anything. Okay, perfect. Okay, so. Um, but here is an interesting thing. Here is an interesting thing. Uh, you can describe Zor element in terms of non Zor elements. You, you can uh, describe it in terms of and, uh, nand, and or. Right. So we can Google that up. Zor in terms of uh, and or right can we find anything so i remember like we, we want to find the formula uh zor and the other okay so bitwise operator from only or and and okay so this is the minus but we don't really have a minus that why why minus like how is that a good answer you suggesting minus my god uh yeah that's a that's a good one that's another one essentially um let's try google because this one is useless <clears throat> so i remember there was one uh, is Zor combination. There's one that I really liked. Uh, there's one that I really liked, and that was, I think, uh, that was, I think, like X um, or Y, X or Y, then uh, X and Y negative, like so this is NAND, and all of that AND, right? And that was Zor, right? That was Zor. And I really like this uh, description, right? Uh, and I'm gonna show you why. Uh, so let me quickly uh, maybe do uh, do this thing. I wanna confirm that this is actually Zor. Uh, I wanna quickly confirm. We can easily confirm that, right? So we can just iterate uh, size x, zero, x less than two, plus plus x, uh, right? And this is going to be y, y. And we can just print all of it. Right. So ZU, Zor, ZU equals ZU. So X or Y, we've got that, and X and Y. Will that work? That's a good question. Git. Uh, so what you, yeah, so we also have to provide this thing. Uh -huh. Okay, that worked. So that's one uh, of the descriptions uh, of the description of Zor, right? Uh, and I kind of like this one, right? Because you have three three elements in here. You have or, uh, nand, and and. And as I already demonstrated, all of the three are modelable by a single neuron, right? So we already demonstrated that. So if we switch to uh, to here, right? So let's go ahead and just like do that. Um, so maybe I'm going to have. So this is the. Uh, let's put or in here. So this is going to be one, one, one. So or train. <clears throat> so let's say that the train is going to be essentially four. So it has this four, and uh, the actual. Uh, train in here, right? So it's going to be train pointer uh, to three, and I'm not even sure how better describe this entire thing. Uh, I want to say that we have a like, yeah, goddamn C. C makes it kind of difficult. So I want to have a pointer to uh, an array of three elements pointer to an array of three elements and i don't really know how syntactically describe that because it's goddamn c right so one of the things i can probably do i can do type def where i can say okay float uh three and let's say it's a sample right something like sample uh, and here i can say we have an array of like of samples in here and here i have a just a pointer to the sample so i think it's a little bit easier 
to to do it like that because then I'll be able to switch between different training sets if you know what I mean. So this one could be like four uh, or whatnot, right? So I think that's kind of cool because now, right? I want to be able to just like literally switch between them. Right? So then this is going to be end uh, right in here. All of them are zeros, right? All of them are zeros, and then end is basically that. But zeros become ones, right? Zeros become ones, and one become zero, right? So we're gonna start with or, uh, right? So I suppose maybe that's what you want. Yeah, that's what you want. Okay, cool. So it had a warning in here because uh, yeah, we don't have a return zero in here, and let's not print any tracing so it doesn't slow down in the in this thing. Okay, so this is or. Right, this is OR, uh -huh. then I switch to END, this is END, uh, we, we can clearly see, so zero, 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 1, and uh, this is NAND, right. So all of the three are modelable by a single neuron, right, uh, we know that for a fact. So, and uh, essentially how we can... Uh, we can describe how can we build an architecture of this neural network, right? So we have two inputs like X and Y, right? So we have X and Y. So, and then we have a layer, right? The first element of which supposedly, right? Supposedly is uh, essentially OR. So this is OR. Uh, this one, uh, just a second. Uh, this one is supposed to be NAND, NAND. And then we get the last neuron here, which is supposed to be AND, right? So, and how are we supposed to connect them? We take X, uh, we feed it into OR, and we take Y and we feed it into OR. Then we take X and Y, feed them into NAND. There we go. And we've got two values that we then feed into the final AND, and we're gonna get the Y as the final result, right? So this is basic architecture of this neural network and its justification. So here's an interesting thing. I'm not saying that these specific neurons are gonna be OR, NAND, and AND. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this is one of the ways to organize this circuit. And let's just allocate enough neurons for a neural network to potentially organize it like that. If it organizes it differently, it's none of the, our business, right? Maybe it will find a better configuration. Maybe it will just use something else in here, right? So it doesn't matter. We use these specific gates as a justification for this specific architecture. We allocate, okay, so this is how many of these things it probably needs. So let's just give it give this amount of things to the model, right? So, uh, and that's why we're going to be organizing it like that. So, so as you can see, we gradually bump up the amount of parameters, right? And here's an interesting thing. Uh, each of these neurons, right? So we have uh, three neurons in here, right? So this is one, two, and three. This is near the neuron because this is just an input. So in each of them are going to have its own weight and bias. So this one is going to have two weights, uh, V, W1, W2, and bias, right? So for these two inputs, and this one is going to have W1, W2, and bias, right? And this one is also going to have its own W1, W2, and bias. So here we have a nine parameters, right? So we went from one parameter two parameters, then three for uh, modeling the gates and stuff like that. Now we have nine parameters, so we even closer to one trillion parameters. So as you can see, we're just like piling more and more uh, parameters into the model and becomes more and more powerful. It's capable of modeling more and more sophisticated things. And here is an interesting thing. So essentially you can think of this entire approach as automatic uh, circuit design, right? So, for instance, what if you have like a truth table of a summer, a thing that sums up, uh, for example, I don't know, um, uh, four bits, and you just define a bunch of truth table and you allocate enough 
uh, neurons to design that circuit and you just give it to the machine learning algorithm and it will find uh, like a good configuration that actually sums up to things you can actually build circuits out of that like literal circuits that do things i mean so why not right why designing circuit yourself right if you can just like feed a truth table into that and it will find the configuration of that truth table for you uh and all gates will be NAND. Yeah, exactly. There is a thing about uh, the, the logic, the Boolean logic, is that you can describe any uh, any element as NAND. You can build like any circuit with only NAND elements. I heard about that. Um, so, but we're modeling only like uh, digital circuits and stuff like that. But we can model anything, right? So this is like a universal circuit, right? If you have data to to train this thing on you can you can just do it anyways anyways so let's try to code this entire thing again i'm not going to be using matrices or derivatives or any of that nerdy shit right for now right uh we're going to keep the level of nerdiness down i know it's kind of hard on my channel but that's what we're trying to do so uh i'm going to create a separate uh separate file in here right so, okay, so we need nine parameters, right? We need nine parameters. So let's actually create a structure uh, for the ZOR model, right? For the ZOR model. So, and essentially, uh, we're gonna roughly say that this is uh, the, like, first, first layer is gonna be OR and, and AND, and the second layer is gonna be AND, right? And let's just, like, allocate um, neuron per per this element, per this gate. So we're going to have uh, OR W1, OR W2, and then OR bias. So this is for the first one. Then uh, for the second one, which is NAND, we're going to allocate another one. And then for the last one, uh, right, we're going to do AND. So this is our model, right? This is our model that has uh, three neurons, right? And actually, uh, two layers. So the first layer consists of these two neurons, and the last layer consists of this neuron. Right. So, and we need a function that, uh, given inputs x and y, just basically feeds this x and y into into the neural network and spits out the final result. So this kind of operation in neural networks, as far as I know, it's called forwarding. So we can uh, divide, uh, define something like forward, right? So we're feeding data in forward into the neural network, uh, right? So it's going to return float, right? It's going to return like a single value. It's going to accept the model itself, right? So this is the model and the inputs X and Y, right? So uh, first we are gonna feed it into OR. Right, we're feeding that into OR. So that means I do OR W1 multiply by X <clears throat> plus M OR W2 multiply by Y. Multiply by Y plus OR bias. Right, and this is our sort of like a first value. So this is going to be A. Uh, right. So then we repeat this entire process, but for NAND. Right. Right. And here we have two intermediate values in here. So, and then we use these intermediate values for the final end, uh, end gate, right? So this is going to be end w1 plus b, m end w2 plus m and b. And this is the final result. Right. On top of that, we also need to squish the results of these things, we, do, we don't want to uh, let them be like unbounded. So we need the uh, sigmoid. Right. Let's actually grab the sigmoid, put it in here. So after we apply this thing, we're going to do sigmoid f, uh, then sigmoid f, and the last one, sigmoid here in here. So as you can see, so we feed the input into the first neuron, the same input into the second neuron, and we're finished with the first layer. Right, so this is sort of like the first layer. And then for the last layer, we take the results of the previous layer and feed them into the last neuron, and we're gonna get the, the final result. Right, again, I'm not using any neural shit like matrices or anything like that. I'm just doing everything manually and doing it as explicitly as possible. There is a uh, there is an explicit mapping between this architecture and the actual code we put in here. Right. Nothing obscures, nothing stays in the way. This is how we do that. Right. Again, everything I do into this stream, this is not how you do that in production. 
right? This is not how you do that in production. So there is more if, like efficient way of representing the neural networks and doing operations and forwarding through neural networks, right? So this is quite important to remember, actually. This is quite important to remember. Anyways, so uh, we're gonna have some training data, right? So for the Zor, right? So I'm going to copy paste this stuff in here. Uh, okay. So we're gonna call it Zor train. And here, zero is zero, one, one, zero. There we go. Uh, cool. So, and I suppose I'm going to just copy paste this entire thing as well right so this is going to be zor train and we have four four samples in the data and what's interesting is that i suppose the cost function is going to stay basically the same except instead of uh, accepting uh, the parameters of the neuron we're going to accept the whole model in here we're accepting the whole model uh right and instead of like calling this stuff directly uh, like forwarding uh, in place, we're going to just forward uh, forward uh, x1 and x2 uh, with the model, along with the model. Maybe I should have called them x1 and x2 in the forwarding as well, but I mean, yeah. I think I want to call them x1 and x2. Man. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Think. For, for the sake of consistency, for the sake of consistency, I'm gonna call it like that. Right, so cost function is basically the same, is that I abstracted the way we forward data into the model. So now, uh, as far as a cost function is concerned, the model can have whatever architecture you want. So cost function doesn't know anything about the architecture of this, uh, of this model, right? So what it does, it just feeds two numbers into it, and it doesn't know how many neurons in there. It doesn't fucking know, it doesn't care. Uh, right, which is usually a bad thing because the more assumptions you have about these things, the more optimal you can make it, right? So especially if you're using like an actual gradient descent, an actual back propagation, you kind of, um, you know, unbox that black box. But here we're trying to keep this thing simple just to show the essence of this entire approach. Right, so anyway, so we probably want to um, have a random uh, random model. So let's create some sort of a function called randzor, right? So this is a randzor. Uh, float uh, randzor, and it should be rather straightforward, right? So just initialize all of these things. Uh, I'm going to remove this stuff uh, right. with random values, right? So we're going to use a little bit of an emacs magic, right? So m, boom, equal rand float boom and just return m uh, and we probably want to create that m somewhere here there we go we've got random zor get random zor uh, it would be nice to also be able to print uh, the, the value of this model, right? Because we want to be able to see what's inside, like what are the uh, weights and biases, right? So let's do uh, print zor. We're going to accept the model in here. Uh, all right, and I'm going to, again, copy paste all of that stuff in here. Unfortunately, we're programming in C, right? In 2023, this is the stuff that the language is supposed to generate for you, but C is kind of stuck in the 70s, unfortunately. So it is what it is, and it isn't what it isn't. Is it not? I think it is. Uh, so yeah, there we go. So we created a random Zor, and then I want to print that random Zor just to see what's inside of it, right? There we go. Uh, okay, so we need to modify the build script. I'm going to add Zor in here. Okay, so we rebuilt some stuff. So let's go through the compilation errors. So we need the math. What else do we need? Uh, so it, uh, okay, it doesn't have a random stuff. Let's copy paste rand float. All right, so this is a rand float. Let's put it in here. What else do you want? So we're starting to have a lot of common things. Maybe one of the things we want to do, we want to start extracting them to um, separate function, right? To a separate function. Mm -mm. Oh, here's an interesting point. Yeah, I, I think I heard that. Uh, I think I heard that. Brain is a 90 billion neurons and GPT 3.4 is actually very close. And GPT 4 is actually more. Uh, it's trillion. So it's supposed to be more smart 
than human. But here's an interesting thing, because a neurons is actually, you can think of, of them as code, right? So, and as software developers, as professional, uh, very experienced software developers, we know that more code does not necessarily mean more features, right? This is the first thing, right? So it's, it's how the things are connected, also very important. Second thing, a single neuro, uh, human neuro, neuron is not equal to artificial neuron. Actually, a single human neuron is way smarter, uh, is may, way more sophisticated than just a thing that sums up its inputs multiplied by weights and biases and just, you know, activates it. Right. As far as I know, scientists were trying to model a single human neuron with a separate artificial neural network that had like million parameters. Think about that. Like a single human neuron requires like, I, I don't know, like I don't want to lie on that, but you had to like have the separate artificial neural network just to model a single human neuron was something like that. Uh, one human neuron, one million, yeah, so one million around like that. So it's like it's not one-to-one -one comparison actually. Like one human neuron is more powerful than one, uh, you know, computer neuron. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <clears throat> uh, humans uh, have uh, 500 million years of pre-training. <laughs> yeah, sort of, right? As far as not only when the human body develops, like the brain also configures into like very predefined, initial predefined structure that also then evolves over time. Uh, I don't know how it works. I don't want to <laughs> lie <laughs> or anything. Um, so also human neurons are not fed forward, but also pulsed. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Yeah. So it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Though it also doesn't mean that the uh, the artificial neural networks may not outperform humans, right? So it's just like... Um, what it means is that uh, they are kind of difficult to compare. Mm, okay, so this is a random, so we have to return Zor. Okay, so let's do... Uh, let's continue going through the compilation errors. <clears throat> so here we're supposed to get those things from uh, the model, which is kind of hard, gotcha hyper, right, because I have two component warden here, so it means I have to jump once, twice, m dot, boom, there we go, can your Vim do that? Uh, okay, that's cool, uh, so what, what we've got, uh, so I'm, I'm running this thing, so it's supposed to run Zor, there we go, this is the initial state, right, so uh, this is initial Zor model, and this is its initial state, right? So with all its weights, biases, and stuff like that. So I called, uh, I prefixed these things with or, nand, and and, but again, this doesn't mean that they're gonna behave like or, like nand and and. So this is more of like a uh, outline of what we expect, but it doesn't have to be this way, right? So it's just like, for, it's, it's it's to make it easier for me to remember like which neuron goes where, because this is how I think about Zor formula, right? Wishful thinking, yeah, so this is wishful thinking. <laughs> and as we observe soon, this is not how the neural network will actually train all of that. Anyway, so uh, we need to know how well this thing performs, right? So let's actually see how well does it perform, right? So I'm gonna do cost uh, equal F cost uh, M, and there we go. Uh, okay, so, and yeah, so here's the here's the thing, and it doesn't really perform that well. Uh, right, so it's not even close to zero, right. Um, okay, so we usually, uh, how do we compute the finite differences? We wiggle around uh, all of the parameters and then uh, divide them by the, the that wiggle. So, but we had three parameters and it was easy to work with them. But now we have uh, nine parameters. So there are gonna be a lot of copy paste, right? So how can we do that? Uh, let's create a function, uh, finite, finite difference, finite diff. So here we're going to uh, provide the model, right? And uh, we're gonna return a new model, which is going to store the differences by which we have to modify this entire thing. So we accept the model, and here we're gonna get the gradient by which we have to, in, in the direction of which we have to move. Actually in the opposite direction, but that's beside the point. Uh, okay, 
so this one is going to be rather interesting, all right, because we have to sort of um, modify this thing by the epsilon, right? We have to modify this thing by the epsilon. Compute its cost, compute its cost, all right. Uh, right, so we also need to have the original cost, right? So we need to have the original cost C, uh, cost M. So we wiggle the first parameter by the epsilon. We get the new cost, subtract from the original cost and divide it by the, uh, by the epsilon. And now we need to add it to the gradient. So we need to sort of like have a separate model in here. So it's called G, uh, right? And this one is gonna be G or W1. Uh, right, and now we need to bring it back, right? So because we want to wiggle the rest of the elements. So essentially, uh, we can just basically save the value. <laughs> it would have been it would have been easier if these parameters were array of floats, right? It would have been way easier, so I wouldn't have to do that. But for the sake of explicity, uh, I'm I'm like copy pasting the code, right? So we're gonna save the initial value of the model, we add this small wiggle to that thing, compute the new cost, find the difference, and then um, we're gonna restore the same thing. So I could have just like do something like minus epsilon, but we have to keep in mind that we're working with floats. Adding and subtracting thing from floats actually introduces error, and doing these things like that accumulates the error. So to prevent the error, I'm actually saving, like literally saving bit by bit original bits and restoring the original bits. Right. So that's why I just don't subtract epsilon. It would work in case of integers, but in case of floats, it's rather dangerous because um, the plus and minus uh, are in float in I three seven five four are really prone to uh, to, to accumulate in errors, right? So multiplication doesn't really introduce that many errors, but plus minus actually very fucky wackish. Anyway, so this is what we have to do per parameter. It's kind of dumb. I do understand that. Please forgive me. Uh, but it is what it is and it isn't what it isn't. Is it not? I think it is. Uh, okay, so this is what we save. Then we take the same parameter, add the epsilon, right? Then we compute the gradient, so we take the cost of the modified model, subtract from the original cost, divide by the epsilon, and then we restore the saved thing. Boom. There we go. Can you be do that? Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Look at that beautiful, beautiful copy please. <laughs> oh. So and then we return the, the gradient in here, as you can see there. There we go. Isn't that pogers? Isn't that pogos? Anyway. Uh, cool. So um, let's see. So here we can actually print our, uh, what's it, print Zor? Yeah, it was print Zor. Print Zor M. Then uh, I'm going to separate this entire stuff by the line. And then I'm going to print the finite difference. Finite difference in here. There we go. So let's see the difference between them. Okay, so it didn't work because it wants epsilon. We can actually provide the epsilon here. Why not? Uh, let's put it in here. Uh, float epsilon, let's say it's going to be like one tenth. Cool. So, essentially, this is the original random model. And this is the values that we need to subtract from the original model to drive it towards the local minimum of the cost function. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So that's basically what it is. Uh, right. Uh, again, this is not how we're supposed to do in a real uh, case scenario, but it's gonna work for us, right? It's going to work for us. <clears throat> cool. So, and let's repeat this entire process. So we take the finite difference, uh, right? So let me, let me remove all of that. Uh, and that is basically the uh, our difference, our gradient. And now we need to take all of the parameters and subtract them from M, right? So we need a separate function to do that with a lot of copy paste, right? So uh, let's say apply difference, right? So here we're gonna accept the original model. The thing that we got from the finite difference 
and also we'll also need the 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 rate the learning rate we can actually call it something cool let's call it train so you you can feel that we're doing something serious you can feel that we're doing ai machine well okay so people say in choo choo <laughs> okay this is not what i meant right people say choo choo so okay so it doesn't mean that it sounds cool what could be look The machine is learning. How about that? It's in focus. It's in focus. Okay, so I think we've got some subs. Uh, oh yeah, we've got some subs that I didn't acknowledge. I'm really sorry. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Venduza, for um, for Twitch Prime with the message. No regret watching such a cool instructor. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, honestly, I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm not an AI uh, person at all. I literally know nothing about AI. I'm just screwing around, literally. Uh, right, I'm just taking the premise of machine learning, which is basically, right, so you have a cost function and you just screw around with the model until the cost function is uh, small enough and you're good to go. Right, so that's what I do. But I don't do that professionally. I don't know the details or any tricks and stuff like that. I'm just uh, playing with this idea, right, of this paradigm of programming where you're not uh, where you not code the thing directly, but you code it indirectly, right? So this is very interesting in my opinion. Uh, Junior Fretas, thank you so much for tier one subscription, and Copper Casey, thank you so much for tier one subscription as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, all right, all right. We've got another sub. Okay, thank you so much, Siri Nox. I hope I pronounced your nickname correctly. Thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Really appreciate it. Anyway. Okay, so we're gonna do learn, right? And essentially we just need to do the usual thing, right? So I suppose if we're gonna get serious about all of that stuff, we will just like make it an array so it's easier to do these things, uh, right? But for now, we're not being super serious about that stuff. So who cares? We take M and we're subtracting the G. Ah, God damn it! okay, the G. But again, we don't wanna subtract it right away because it could be too big we want to multiply it by some certain a certain rate right so it doesn't go too fast and then we can just return the modified thing in here so it's going to be this going to be a pure function uh right since the the entire model is just a structure this entire thing can be a pure function uh all right so okay uh we can do the following thing uh, i want to print the the cost of the function before we uh, basically modified it, right? So this is going to be cost of M. Uh, then I do uh, learn, all right, learn M G. I need to provide the rate. So we know that the rate of one tenth is actually a good one. Uh -huh. And then I'm printing the cost again, just to make sure that it actually drives it down, right? Uh, right, so I just want to make sure that it drives it down and let's put the semicolon in here. Uh, does it okay so as you can see it became smaller we can work with that we can optimize it right so that's cool so this is the cost uh we're gonna be printing it uh let's actually print it after we modify this entire thing and let's do that several times right uh, let's do that several times A boom okay so how about 10. Mm cool so it's going down nice thousand of times uh i'm not going to run this entire thing right i'm gonna only compile and we're gonna try to run it from from here it's actually went below 25. remember i think when we were trying to do that we like with a simpler neural network it was not able to go below 25 i think i think it was not able to do that uh right so let me find the train Right, so uh, do we have Zor? Right, so let's introduce Zor. So this one is gonna be zero, zero. Zor train, Zor. Uh, let me try to recompile. And if I do gates, uh-huh. It doesn't uh -huh, trace anything. Yeah, it stayed at 25. 
Right, so no matter what you do, it doesn't, it stays at 25, it doesn't go below, right? Uh, it cannot do that, like it doesn't have enough parameters and stuff like that. But if we do XOR, uh, it's already lower than 25. And it's only a thousand of times, right? What if we give it more time to, to train and like learn something? Uh, right, so what about uh, 10,000 parameters? Mm -hmm. Look at how it's like way below 25. It's way like it, it's actually doing something interesting because it's more, it has a more complicated architecture. What the fuck? Okay, so what if we give it maybe, I don't know, half of a million? What about half of a million? It's not bad, but I mean, uh, what about million? So am I... Oh. Excuse me, I'm modifying the wrong product. Right, so what about 100? Uh, right. <laughs> What's the wrong program? Sorry. Uh, yo, what the fuck? It's actually very good cost. Look at... It's almost zero. It's, it actually performs what we want. What the fuck? <laughs> All right. So let's actually see how well it performs, right? Let's see how well it performs. We're going to do the usual trick. Uh, zero, two, plus I. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then uh, let's print ZU, ZU, and F. Right, so essentially I, J, and we forward the final model, right, we forward the final model, uh, M, I, J. Right, so since the accept floats, it will cast the size C, the T to float, we don't have to worry about it. And so here we can put uh, the line, we can put the line in here, right, and uh, let's see what's going to happen. So, okay, it's going somewhere. Below five, below half, above half, above half, below five. Zor, mother flipper, mother flipper, Zor. You know what's cool about that specific neural network? Uh, right, you know what's cool about that specific neural network? The, it works not only with Zor. So the, the neural network with one neuron can only do OR, AND, and NAND. Uh, this, but it cannot do Zor. This one can do Zor and everything before. It can also do OR. It can also do end. We can actually check that, right? So we just add more parameters. We make it a little bit more complicated, and now it it, it can accommodate more gates, right? So it can become any of those. Let's actually copy paste all of that data in here, right? And and test that, uh, right? So so where is the training data, right? So this is a Zor train, uh, right? So let's see if I put or in here, right? If I put or in here and recompile it. Uh, will it become or? Actually, it becomes or way easier. So, yeah, it becomes or. 0, 1, 1, 1. Right, 0, 1, 1, 1. Uh, then what about end? Can it become end? Mm, let's train it a little bit. Mm -mm. It's 0, 0, 0, 1. It can become end. Uh, and uh, end. Right, we're, we're using the same architecture in here. We're literally using the same architecture, just more than one neuron, and it can still act like all of these elements. Uh, so NAND has to be 1, 1, 1, 0. Uh, yeah, 1, 1, 1, 0. That's pretty cool. But on top of that, it can also do ZOR. Uh, so it's just like more powerful. It can become more things. Uh, it's more flexible. Nor, uh, this one... Yeah, so it, it accepts two parameters, right? So it accepts two parameters. So we need probably the one that accepts one parameter, but we can try to make it maybe ignore the second one or something like that, but I don't want to go into that. So one of the things I wanted to actually check, right? So here we allocated three neurons, hoping that uh, they will roughly correspond to OR, NAND, and AND, because that's how you can express that's how you can express nor ah nor i see let, let, let's try nor uh, for some reason my brain interpreted nor as a not yeah i'm sorry <laughs> okay uh nand let's actually code uh the data for for nor nand okay so nor uh and it's essentially one 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 zero 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 right 
So let's put more in here. I'm pretty sure it will be to do that, but I don't know. Maybe there is a trick in here. It goes well. Uh, looks like Nord to me, so it can can handle all of them. So essentially, this particular neural network can act like any gate, right? Basically, I think, right? So whatever you train it to be, it will act like that thing, uh, right? So depending on the configuration of these things. Uh, okay, but here is an interesting thing. Let's actually train Zor, right? Let's train Zor. Uh, as I already said, th these things are not necessarily what they're going to be. Uh, this is just sort of like a justification for the architecture of this neural network. Let's explore how exactly those things actually behave. Let's actually isolate these individual neural neurons and do the truth table on them and see what is their truth table. Isn't that interesting? So now we, we were treating this thing as a black box, right? So this is a black box with three neurons. We don't really know what they correspond to. Let's try to dissect this thing and see how it behaves. Does it really behaves like or, and, and, and? Probably not. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Let's actually find out because it's, it's very interesting, right? So we're doing robot surgery. Yeah, exactly. How can we do that? Uh, we can just like forward this thing directly, right? We can forward this thing directly by using this formula, right? We can bypass this for, uh, forward function. Uh, okay, so let's just do that. Uh, maybe we want to actually separate this thing like so, right? So we're separating this thing like so. Uh, okay, so here is or. So the input is going to be i, j, uh, or. Okay. Mm -mm. So let's see. Um, so maybe it would also make sense to maybe print uh, this thing like this. Uh, or uh, neuron. And I put it in quotation marks because, uh, marks because it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the, the or, right? So I'm sort of like emphasizing that. Uh, and let's do zu uh, or zu equal f. Uh, right, and let's do ij, and let's see how it is going to behave. Uh, right, so maybe I'm going to get rid of the tracing to speed up the training, right? Uh, to speed up the training, and uh, let's go. Okay. Surprisingly, this one acts, so zero, this one acts like end. Yeah, this is end. <laughs> That's funny. So the OR found it, basically the learning process found a configuration where the OR became an end. And what's interesting is that OR is on the first uh, layer. So end was supposed to be here, but it actually put it in here. So it found a different formula. Right. It's it's kind of endish, right? So it's kind of endish. Uh, so if, what's funny is that it's supposed to be different every time. Uh, right. Well. We're not randomizing properly. Okay, so SRAND, uh, SRAND is going to be time zero. And also, I want to print the last cost function just to, just to make sure that we didn't hit a really weird place in a, in a cost function domain that there is no proper minimum or something like that. I just want to make sure that that's the, that's the right cost function because you, you never know what you're going to hit in there. So let me see. Uh, okay, so the cost function is good enough, uh, right? And it's still kind of endish. And did I not? Am I modifying a wrong place again? <laughs> it did change. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So I'm I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, I'm sorry. So this one acts now like like or. This one, this time, it works like OR. Yeah, yeah. so I, I was looking at here somewhere or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it acts like, it, it acts differently from time to time. Right, it acts differently from time to time. So, uh, all right, let's take a look at the, uh, the rest of the things, right? So the next one is going to be NAND, uh, right? And NAND, let's define it like so. So this is NAND, uh, and I'm going to replace this thing with NAND in here, and let's see what's going to happen. Uh, maybe I want to do something like TeamUX, so it's a little bit easier for me, uh, right? Okay, 
this endish more or less the, is this nand this is actually an end it, it does act like an end right this one does act like an end i think no not really actually this one this is nor what if yeah this is nor <laughs> oh it's even or oh my god i'm, I'm already tired i'm sorry yeah, yeah yeah so that's cool so it it finds different like configurations every time right so and let's take a look at the last one well, let's take a look at the last one so the last one has to be and uh the output one uh so and just the regular end um and uh -huh. okay i forgot to remove the parent the parent the close parent but in any case this one is this one is weird even like what what the fuck is this it's just like zero one is one but one zero is zero so it just like came up with the random thing but what's cool about this random thing at the end combined together they still act like zor so we're just letting the neural network to do whatever so, some of these things may not be even proper like binary gates right so maybe some of them work out purely because they're continuous right so that's what's cool about this entire thing so it's just like it it can do whatever right it can have some weird intermediate states some of them are not even real but overall overall it acts like zor and every time it builds a different configuration so uh what if we another interesting question what if we give it just more neurons like even more neurons and will it come up with more complicated circuits like for example adder what if i okay so let me let me try to draw so another interesting thing to try out to bump up the amount of uh you know parameters would be uh take four inputs right so this is going to be four inputs and this is your first number right then take another four of them right another four of them <clears throat> and basically allocate like some amount of neurons and just connect all of these things uh to like these hidden layers like to all of these hidden la layers like so and as the output <clears throat> have four neurons as the output right and train it to add together these two numbers like take the, the bits of this number the bits of this number and add them together and have it to be uh the thing will it come up with an actual circuit over summer to do that that would have been interesting actually right you know what i mean like and we can even try to estimate how many neurons you, you you need to have and how deep the neural network has to be to sort of create such circuit right um and that's very interesting that's a very interesting project to actually uh try to tackle but we're gonna do that next time i'm gonna do that next time because i'm already streaming for almost three hours so this is gonna be for the next stream and this is actually very cool paradigm you see so it starts up like if you start like exploring this entire thing as something boring like remember what we started with we started with this stupid shit like look at that this is what we started with right what's interesting about a simple linear formula but as you start to explore this idea of just like having this cost function and this model and tweaking the parameter until the cost function becomes zero and then you bump up the amount of parameters you can come up with more and more interesting things to tackle and it becomes more and more interesting so what's going to be the next uh some time ago actually um i think i did a project on the first ever perceptron do you guys remember yeah so uh i, I wonder if i can find that i wonder if i can find it uh, perceptron yeah, yeah, yeah so it's a project that is inspired by veritasium video on the first ever perceptron yeah, yeah so here's the thing the point of the perceptron was to uh detect uh whether whatever is drawing on the screen is a circle 
or a square. And what, uh, how it is done is uh, basically by creating a two-dimensional layer of uh, neurons, right, which basically sum everything up with certain weights and classifying this thing, whether it's a, a circle or rectangle. And it's trained by a very weird process where if it wrongly classified something, we subtract a circle from the weights or something like that. It's like never really trained anything useful. It's a really flawed way of training this entire thing. And uh, the cool thing about this specific example is that you don't need a lot of human-generated data to train this thing. You can generate all of the data procedurally, right? You can generate all of the data procedurally. By the way, whatever you see on the screen is basically the change of the weights as uh, during the learning process. But the learning process is actually really weird and flawed. It doesn't really go anywhere. So what I was thinking, we can take this as even bigger project to tackle. Can we build a similar neural network that classifies uh, whatever image it sees as a circle or a rectangle? The cool thing about this specific example, again, is that because we don't need a lot of human-generated data, we can just generate data ourselves, right? So, uh, yeah, that would be in another interesting thing to tackle. But I first would like to tackle the, the summer, the thing that sums up to uh, two numbers, right? But again, all of that is already for the next time, uh, right? So, and to tackle all of these more complicated problems, we need to come up with uh, adder. I'm sorry, yeah. So it's supposed to be called adder, uh, right? To tackle these more complicated uh, problems, we need to come up with the better representations of the neural network. Because what the fuck is this? Excuse me. Right, and you can clearly see what kind of problems it uh, creates. Just look at the finite di difference. Like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> what? Like, imagine, like, OpenAI uh, copy-pasting the same code one trillion of times just to build GPT-4. Like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, it's not a good representation. Right, so we'll need to come up with a better representation to tackle more complicated problems, right? And this is one of the things we may try to do already on the second episode of Machine Learning in C. Right. Uh, anyways, uh, that's it for today. I've been streaming for almost three hours and I usually stream for two hours. Uh, thanks everyone who's watching me right now. I really appreciate it. Have a good one, and I see you uh, next time. I love you all. Mwah.